All right, everybody, it's March 18th, 2020. And what do you do when you're stuck inside with a whole lot of free time? You make an unboxing video. This is a order I placed with uh, Mandarake. Mandarake? Mandarake. They are the largest secondhand comics, figures, garage kits, idle goods, general otaku crap uh retailer in japan and i ordered this uh a little over a week ago because i wasn't sure if i'd be able to place any orders or anything ever again so why don't we crack it open and take a look ah, away with you all right so started so first we got Godzilla Gaiden. Now, this is a doujinshi uh, put out by uh, Shinji Nishikawa that uh, might not be a name you're immediately familiar with, but he's been a sort of monster designer for the uh, Godzilla films since Godzilla vs. Biollante. And he also worked on, you know, uh, he designed the... Kiryu, Mechagodzilla, I think Megagirus was one of his. And he's been kind of relatively unknown in circles, unless you're really into tokusatsu and kaiju stuff. But um, luckily he's been getting, I think, getting a little more prominence these days. And he got his start writing Godzilla doujinshi, writing Godzilla fan comics. So this right here is this is i think a sequel comic to one of his earlier works he got to start in the 80s doing godzilla doujinshi and every so often he does still put out new stories and it's kind of it's like urusei yatsura but basically if instead of lum it was about the uh cyborg girl from terror of mecha godzilla living with a guy Hey, we are VR. You can tell he's an older kind of uh, manga artist because he's going for the whole like bikini warrior girls sort of thing. Right, see, we got Jet Jagar, Mogura, Mechanicong, Mechagodzilla, and Gigan. Gigan got some upgrades. This is a 1977 issue of Shonen Sunday. Or is this Shonen Weekly? Um, this, this is very interesting. You know, you can get a lot of these phone book size manga anthologies for pretty relatively cheap uh, from Mandarake. They go for about 300 yen to about a thousand yen, which is like three bucks to ten bucks thereabouts, and they are very, very dense. Um, who knows? Maybe you want to take one apart and you can decoupage a table with old manga pages. But you might be wondering why did I get a issue of Shonen Sunday from 1977? Because it has a feature story on Nobuhiko Obayashi's classic horror film, House. So let's see if I can find it. Oh, that was fast. <laughs> Some of the actresses from the film. Tezuka, still alive, still doing his thing. Oh my god, look at that. That is, look at that thing. That is, I want one of those in my living room. Yes. When I think about uh, record players, I think... Thuk and GGGG. There was also uh, a manga adaptation of the movie House. Oh, here it is. It is in here. Not sure if this is Gona Guy or Ken Ishikawa. That looks like Ken Ishikawa to me, but I could be wrong. Next, I got this hardbound uh, book about the manga The Mudmen by Daijiro Morohoshi. 
Uh, Taijiro Morohoshi is one of the most influential horror and supernatural manga authors in Japan. Um, unfortunately, very little of his work has been officially released in English. Um, the uh, British Museum just had a manga exhibition and uh, their exhibit book included one of his stories translated to English. I think you can get some of his stuff translated to French and Spanish. But other than that, it hasn't really left Japan, which is a shame because he was uh, monumentally influential to uh, anime and manga in Japan from, you know, Evangelion to Princess Mononoke. Mud Men was a manga he did about, well, the Mud Men of Papua New Guinea. Uh, not exactly a documentary, but this sort of book, looking back at the history of it, we get some photos of Morohoshi himself in New Guinea with the real mud men. If you're familiar with SNK fighting games, you might know the character uh, Mudman from World Heroes was also influenced by this manga. Also, the band Yellow Magic Orchestra did a song called Mad Men. Every time I look away, I hear the mad men go. But that was a mistranslation because the song is actually called Mud Men. But when the studio went to pressing with the record, they changed mud to mad. But it's actually, if you look at the lyrics, the song is like about the manga. So these are some of uh, Morohoshi's sketches of the actual uh, people of Papua New Guinea based on uh, what he saw. Morohoshi has this style that it's really, he really straddles a line between like cartoony and realistic. It's, it really is a very distinct style. Not to mention, I love the, the sense of scale that he can give to his creatures. So yeah, definitely write to, write to the manga publishers out there. Write to Denpa, write to 7C. Say, hey, bring over some uh, Daijiro Morohoshi. Oh, holy shit, it's Rumiko Takahashi. See, he has some fans out there. Little... Rumiko Takahashi sketch of some of his characters. There have been some movies uh, based on Morohoshi's work that got a U.S. release. Um, if you know the Shinya Tsukamoto movie, Hiruko the Goblin, that was based on his popular manga, um, Yokai Hunter. And Yokai Hunter is kind of like, it, it's kind of like Kolchak. Or like other kind of like supernatural procedurals where a guy like travels the world in search of like weird monsters and what have you. All right, next we got Comic Box Junior, which was a side publication to uh, the magazine or the manga anthology Comic Box. Um, I'm not super familiar with this publication, but. It's definitely, um, it's manga, but it's not like artsy manga, like Garo. This is, this kind of like goes into the more like otaku sort of sphere, the very burgeoning otaku sphere, uh, because this is still like early or mid eighties. This issue comes from 1984. Um, Comic Box was a manga anthology. Comic Box Junior was more of a general magazine about, you know, what's going on in manga, anime, technology. Everyone's writing about this crazy new thing called VHS and Betamax. Holy shit. You can watch your movies at home now. God damn. Uh, Hideaki Anno actually had a recurring column in this magazine. I'm not, well, I'm going to have to edit that out. Yeah, not only were people like, holy shit, we can watch anime at home. 
People were like, holy shit, we can watch pornographic anime at home. People were really excited about that. Rumiko Takahashi is still big in a big way at this point in time. You know, you got Lum, you got Meizani Koku, um, Angerus is there. Because why not? The kids love Angerus. Gotta have more Angerus. All right, back to something relatively work safe, safe for work. Because you're all at your jobs right now watching this, right? Oh, they got an article about the uh, Rankin-Bass Hobbit movie. Uh, this is the animated version of The Hobbit, and um, this was animated in part by basically Studio Ghibli before Studio Ghibli was a thing. This was uh, done by Studio Topcraft. But it's interesting looking at like a lot of like Japanese artists from this period, because you can definitely see like they're looking, you know, they're picking up issues of Starlog, and they're looking at Mobius, they're looking at Drie. And they're kind of like, holy shit. So they're applying some of that style to, you know, Japanese aesthetics. So, you know, there's this interesting sort of fusion from that period. So, like, the environments feel Mobius. And the machinery, you have this complex machinery, detailed environments. But the characters are still kind of cute and, like, blobby looking. All right. Next. This is from the video game magazine Gamist, uh, which I forget if Gamist became Famitsu over time uh, or if they were separate publications. But basically it was one of the biggest uh, video game publications in Japan during like the 80s and 90s. And this is one of their side magazines, Gals Island. Uh, this is the third one. And it's basically fan art and pictures of girls from different video games from the period. And because this is early 90s, a lot of it is characters from fighting games. So you got, you know, Art of Fighting, Samurai Showdown. So let's take a look. Yep, Fatal Fury, Samurai Showdown, Street Fighter, all the big titles at this t period. This is the most normcore ass picture of Andy Bogard and my Shiranui I've ever seen. <laughs> but like this went from like, I guess, probably modern and cool from when it was written, drawn to passe. And now it's probably come back around again to being aesthetic. This is great. This was done as a, I think this was done as a promotion for the Street Fighter 2 um, upgrade. I think Hyper Fighting was the one that let you do mirror matches. So they had to come up with, you know, new colors for Chun-Li's costume. Charlotte from uh, Samurai Showdown. One of the really cool characters, she's based on uh, Oscar from the manga Rose of Versailles, uh, which you can actually now read in English. Udon finally put it out. Yeah, King. There needs to be way more King in this. King is cool. And now we got like a fan art showcase. I love looking at old fan art because it really is like a, a way of seeing what people were into at the time these magazines were put out. Sometimes you wonder, like, what happened to the people that drew these? Did they go into professional manga, you know, writing or drawing? Did they stop drawing altogether? Are, are some of them even still alive? All right, let's take a look at what's next. B Club. Now, B Club was a publication put out by Bandai that uh, kind of connected to the world of like garage kits um, garage kits released by themselves and uh, also had a lot of articles on, you know, manga, anime, tokusatsu.
This issue is from February 1993. And I just love this picture of like, you know, old uh, mechs from, you know, throughout history, you know. I wonder, I think Mitsuru Yokoyama was still alive at this point. So this might have been his art. I could be wrong though, actually. I don't think this is, this might not be by Mitsuru Yokoyama, but it is still. Oh, Tekamon Blade. Or as it was shown in the US on UPN, Techno Man. I want to say Discotech put out all of uh, Tekamon on DVD, but I'm not entirely sure. Whoa. This is from Common Rider Zo or Zio. This was. Uh, this was directed and had effects done by Keita Amamiya of uh, Zera Mangaro fame. And this is, this is the good stuff. Look at that. That is some crazy ass practical special effects monster shit. And we get a short manga also by Keita Amamiya. Amemi is another one of those artists that is hard to really pin down because he's really, he's not interested in trying to imitate other manga artists. He is really going for his own like sort of style. Like some, some pages, like you could see like some, you know, influence from like Enki Bilal and like some aspects you'll see like influence from Japanese woodblock prints. Hell yeah, Toei laser discs, green slime, giant robo. Everything looks better on laser disc. More fan art. Oh yeah, this new uh, anime coming out called Sailor Moon. I don't know, it's about some girl she from the moon. No one's gonna care about it in a few years. Now Vega, if you stay in that pose too long, you're gonna get stuck that way. Oh, a little uh, ad for uh, G Ranger, or the Japanese version of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Oh, this is for the uh, Ambassador Magma uh, anime based on the manga by uh, Ozamu Tezuka. Which was, that was a weird anime. <laughs> but it's neat seeing like these sort of like OVA, like 80s artists kind of like adapting the art style of Tezuka. This is in, this is 1993, so Tezuka has only been dead a couple of years. I think he died in 1989. So they probably intended that to be almost like a, you know, memorial sort of piece. Oh, it's a history of uh, the Shobijin, the fairies from the Godzilla and Mothra films. Which outfit is your favorite? Comment for which outfit is your favorite. Kind of like that one with the hat and the stole. Oh, and here's uh, what home video, what movies are out right now in Japan in 1993. We got the director's cut of Blade Runner, Lawnmower Man, Alien 3. Oh, Tetsuo 2, Body Hammer. Man, Lawnmower Man. Just... Let me tell you something. As a kid, seeing Lawnmower Man, that like really gets you hyped up for VR. Like, holy shit, this is the future. This is going to be amazing. And like, flash forward like 20 something years, you put on Oculus and you're like, okay, this is. This is kind of like Lawnmower Man, I guess. Oh, wow. It's an ad for a special effects school. And I'm pretty sure that is Screaming Mad George. Uh, Screaming Mad George did a lot of uh, effects work for movie like, uh, movies like Predator, uh, Bride of Reanimator, Guyver. He, and he got his start... Uh, I think he was an SVA student. He moved to America, went to SVA, and started like a horror punk band. 
So he would play at like Max Kansas City and CBGBs, you know, along with like the Ramones and stuff. And he would like do songs and like cut his stomach open and have fake guts spill onto the stage. And it's really crazy stuff. And an ad for some uh, Godzilla toys. All right, so next we are looking at the science fiction magazine Uchusen, or Spaceship. Uh, this is a quarterly magazine uh, that is still running in Japan, and it's basically coverage of uh, science fiction, uh, films, uh, tokusatsu. It's almost like a Japanese equivalent to Starlog. That might not be the best comparison, because Starlog is also kind of a dated reference. All aboard the Horror Express. The Horror Express 39 will take you on a journey, a never ending journey. Disney owns that now. <laughs> That's Disney's movie now. You know, the one with the, with the monkey voiced by Frank Welker doing a Nazi salute and people getting shot and their faces melted. That's Disney's now. Oh, we got the... Uh, a little bit of uh, Andy Warhol's Dracula with Udo Kier. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's flesh for Frankenstein. You know, six of one and half a dozen of the other. Horror on VHS was a very big thing in Japan during this time period. Um, it was really one of the most popular genres uh, out there in the rental market. And you can see a lot of that reflected in anime from that time period because there's a lot of, you know, casual gore and heads exploding. Like, even Do You Remember Love has, like, a lot of heads exploding in it. A lot of Uchusen would have, like, these showcases of, uh, like, little, like, dioramas and, like, scratch-built model kits. Picture of... Uh... I can't tell if that's of, like, drawn. That's definitely a picture of Shigeru Mizuki. I'm not sure if that's drawn by Shigeru Mizuki or not. The uh, creator of uh, Gegege no Kitaro. Oh, here's uh, artwork from uh, Ultraman concept designer and monster creator Tol Narita. And this is him drawing the uh, Garuda and... I believe that's supposed to be Ganesh. He did like this uh, f um, this column for Uchusen magazine where he would uh, draw creatures and monsters and gods from different you know mythologies and cultures. I love like the look of some of these. Like one of the things, one of the hallmarks of Tol Narita's art is that everything has a very textured look to it. Like. I, I believe he came out of sculpting. He was a, known as an illustrator, but I'm pretty sure he had a sculpting background. Got an ad for uh, Wonder Festival, 1985. I, I want to say this is the first or like second year, pretty early on for it. And this ad was done by General Products, which was basically... Studio Gynax's retail arm before there was technically a Studio Gynax. Bride of Frankenstein. Oh, it must be. Oh, it's an ad for a garage kit. I love that. The like the like Xerox like still photo and like the pasted on text. It, it looks like an ad for like a Misfits concert. Article on uh, the works of H.P. Lovecraft which was very influential in Japan, though I remember like one time doing a panel on Godzilla at an anime convention. They were like, did, uh, did H.P. Lovecraft influence Godzilla? It's like, no, H.P. Lovecraft did not create all monsters that came out of the water, okay? There were monsters, there were giant monsters that came out of the water before H.P. Lovecraft. Godzilla did not emerge, emerge from rural Rhode Island. Oh, wow, look at that early Yoshitaka Amano artwork. Oh, wait a minute. Look at that. Look at that. It's Hedera. He's great. Got some Hedera. We got... Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> look at Jet Jaguar. <laughs> that is great. 
different videos are out. We got the Rocky Horror. We got Star Wars. Some fan art. What do we got? We got Ultraman, more Ultraman, Hakaider. More Ultraman, Videodrome. I don't know what James Woods is saying there, but it doesn't look good. <laughs> Nothing James Woods says these days is good, though. All right, what's next? Hobby Japan EX. So this was a uh, side publication of Hobby Japan. And this is kind of like a, it was a larger format magazine and also kind of a showcase of different talent that they had. And, uh, you know, so maybe some more unusual model kits and garage kits. And there's a lot of like early uh, Takeyuki Takeya and uh, Yasushi Nirasawa in uh, Hobby Japan EX. So let's take a look. On the back, we got uh, an advertisement for the Zoids model kits. I like Zoids when they're like very like chunky, you know? I like it when they got like wires and like large cannons on them. Like I was never, even though I was like the primary audience for it, I was never that much into the Zoids Toonami show because I didn't like how sleek they looked. They didn't look as interesting. We love figure. I think you just love girls not wearing pants, but okay, you do you. Oh, nice uh, garage kit of uh, Pris from uh, Bubblegum Crisis. Some uh, Gunbuster kits. Min May, believe that's her. Do you remember? Yep, do you remember Love costume? M is for Madoka. Marvel, Mor Morbideza? Mor Morbidezia is not a word, is it? Mature, Man Trap, Marrow, My Sweetheart, Madoka. Basically, everyone trying to make cute anime girls at that point in time was like, you make her look like Jennifer Connelly. Ooh, Borgman, cool. Oh, Deedlet from uh, Record of Lotus War. I might check out that video game that's like kind of a Symphony of the Night ripoff, but with Record of Lotus War characters. Bow! Oh, cool. So this is a garage kit of uh, Araki's pre-Jojo manga, Bow. I guess, yeah, we've got uh, one of the Caesars, one of the Zeppel... Yeah, Caesar Zeppeli and I think Jonathan Joestar. And who cares because the Pillar Men are there and the Pillar Men are way cooler. Dragon Ball. No one's going to care about Dragon Ball in a couple of years. Space, 1999. Highly influential to like a certain age range of uh, anime and manga authors. Like particularly Hideaki Anno. He like worked a lot of Space 1999 references into his work and Barbarella, cause why not? Oh wow, more, more Barbarella. And the process, and you get a lot of these like little tutorials on how to make garage kits. And it's funny cause like, you know, techniques change over time, but a lot of these sort of fundamentals they go over stay the same. But unless you understand Japanese, you kind of have to go by the pictures. Oh, more Zoids. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I want to say this version of the uh, Iron Kong was sculpted or designed by uh, Ko Yokoyama of Machine and Krieger fame. It kind of has a similar sort of like chunky military style to it. Uh, that is really cool looking. Yeah, you see like this kit pops up every so often on like Japanese auction sites and it always goes for like 200 plus dollars. And then this is a, an early Yasushi Nirasawa model. Like you can kind of tell like everything is like so different about this. Cause like, it's like, okay, it's very of its era because it's another like cute bikini girl. 
but at the same time like look at like the weird asymmetry to it like the very like textured monstrous look of like that gauntlet like it's a lot more in line with like kind of like western fantasy art from that time rather than what's going on in japan Yeah, pretty much everything Urasawa designed was very asymmetrical. Yeah, Phantom Core was sort of like his ongoing like storyline and he had like these characters that were part of it. And Nina Dolono was kind of like his main like mascot girl. This is definitely early Urasawa cuz like he's going for a more like grounded look for his characters like later on like his girls would look more cartoonish and like you know almost anime-esque with like very big eyes and stuff and this is his uh comic which ran in hobby japan ex and eventually they did put out a book that collected all the stories well yeah he's very like you can tell he's looking at, like, you know, Western sci-fi films because, like, very sort of, like, H.R. Giger, alien-style, like, you know, design to the monsters. But he's also doing, like, he's writing out the sound effects in English, so he's kind of, like, imitating, like, an American comic book sort of style. But at the same time, this feels very distinctly Japanese. I guess someone wrote about different, uh, their favorite different actresses from various cult movies. Because we got Barbara Crampton as she appeared in From Beyond and uh, Caroline Monroe in Star Crash. Okay, so this is, the title is all in Japanese, but running it through Google Translate, it was something like History of like Monster World or Dream of Monster World. I believe it was a museum exhibition of just creature designs from various artists. Yeah, this stuff is crazy looking. This is always like great, like food for thought whenever, like if you want to work on your own sort of little creative project or just, you know, get some ideas for things. Like it's always fun, like flipping through these different uh, magazines and what have you. Like, oh, look at this thing. It's like a mummified goblin like kind of like a golem sort of thing this weird like vampire bat looking creature like this is sculpted this is fantastic master of the corner this is like one of those scp thing you kids love so much right i want to say i could be wrong but i think that's yuji kaida i actually would say in the index 21, yep, yeah, that's Yuji Kaida. And Yuji Kaida is a really great kaiju artist. And he's done, like, work for, like, all sorts of movies. And he's done, like, novel covers, movie posters, model kit boxes. I think he did the, Kong, the Japanese Kong of Skull Island poster. This one looks very Guido Craypack sort of influenced. Oh, wow, it's Ganesh, but, like, done in this weird sort of, like, anatomical model sort of way. Like, I guess it's almost like combining the scientific and the mythological. Oh, wow, this is more uh, Shinji Nishikawa. I guess these are based on different um, sort of variations of Ultraman monsters. And this one, I, I guess this is, like his take on Cthulhu in a way or something similar but you could tell Shinji Nishikawa comes from like a tokusatsu focused background because like this has a textured and tangible look to it like he drew him in like sort of a you know humanoid sort of pose you could imagine this as like an elaborate costume that you would see on like, you know, a Zerum or a Power Rangers or a Godzilla type thing. It's weird that it's like mechanical, like bordering into like steampunk sort of Cthulhu design. There's a lot of Cthulhu in here. 
but not that much Yog Sagoth or Nyarlathotep. Yet again, more Cthulhu. But I do like that everyone has like their own sort of like unique spin on it. Oh, this, I want to say this is Daijiro Morohoshi. Yep, Daijiro Morohoshi. Again, the dude has a very distinct style to it. It's, I, I really struggle to like put it into words, but like he truly does have like a very unique look. Like these illustrations in particular look very influenced by medieval manuscripts like there's not a lot of depth to them like the coloring is very flat All right, and now we got an issue of the horror magazine v zone uh i wrote a short article about this for the uh website zimmerit but basically v zone was a short-lived horror magazine in japan it started off as sort of a jack of all trades like otaku interest magazine with like model kits and anime and manga but then in its second issue it immediately shifted to being an all horror movie magazine because that's where japan was sort of like going at the time on the back we got an ad for return of the living dead which is called battalion in japan and on the front we got uh halloween 3 which was, you know, growing up, a lot of people were like, uh, Halloween 3 sucks. It doesn't have Michael Myers. But, like, a lot of people have, like, come around and, like, warmed up to it, being like, oh, well, actually, like, it's good because it doesn't have Michael Myers. It does its own thing. Some Stephen King coverage. We got Creep Show, Firestar, Children of the Corn, Christine. I love that, that uh, short in uh, Creep Show. Man. A guy alone, locked in his house while a disease is, like, ravaging him. It's like, I can't imagine what that's like. Viso would also have these, like, guides to, like, how you can make your own, like, special effects at home. Because at this time, um, there's this emerging market of um, V cinema, which is basically cheap direct-to-video, like, action and horror movies. And at this point in time... They were way more focused on horror films. <laughs> Gremlins versus Ghoulies. I don't know, man. Ghoulies are pretty cool. Look at that guy. He's coming out of a toilet. Oh, I like this. It's like, well, Gizmo, he kind of looks like Booska. He kind of looks like Yoda. He kind of looks like an Ewok. They're cute. And then you got the other ones, which kind of look like the rancor it kind of look like other monsters some coverage of uh older you know japanese horror films even though like this magazine is very focused on stuff from america and europe from the time because that's what was hip there was also a lot of coverage of like old japanese horror films stuff like you know onibaba or um tokaido yotsuya kaidan more coverage of uh, Flesh for Frankenstein. I guess people were really into that movie in Japan in the 80s. Oh, this is from uh, the Studio Gainax film about, uh, or sorry, not Studio Gainax. I think at this time they were still uh, Daikon films about uh, Orochi. Orochi Strikes Again, I think. But yeah, this is what I was talking about with like very... V some case low budget and some other cases very low budget horror and sci-fi films made by you know people like Shinji Higuchi and Hideaki Anno when they were like just starting out and they were like hey man let's get together let's build some models let's get some explosives that we really shouldn't have legally and let's make a monster movie and you're sort of I guess maybe this is like a countdown list of like horror movies that are like the ones to get at that point in time. Like, let's see what let's see what they're into in 1983, 84 Japan. Sorry, 1986. Let's see what they're into in 1986 Japan. We got Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Is that children? No, it's Eaten Alive. Flesh for Frankenstein. Don't know. The Man with Two Heads. The Natasha Kinski Cat People movie. 
the Iron Cross, um, or sorry, Cross of Iron. Not exactly what you would traditionally consider a horror film, but um, brutal in its own way. <laughs> the Thing, Rabid, Scanners, Jaws, the making of the Star Wars films. Okay, I guess. Busca, the Beyond, yeah. <laughs> Busca and Italian horror films. Just like two great tastes that taste great together. So this has been my Mandarake unboxing video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be making another order quite this large uh, anytime soon. But I definitely have some other uh, books in my collection. I'd be more than happy to show off. And thank you for watching.